Malcolm McDowell, David Warner, Mary Steenburgen. You take those three people, put them in any movie, I want to watch it. Mm -hmm. But is it H.G. Wells chasing Jack the Ripper? That goes right into my vein. I was a little worried that I'd never talk to you again. Because it's been now four months since our last podcast. (laughs) Yes. So much has happened. Yeah? No. no, no. (laughs) You had a show since we last spoke, right? It is true. um, Totally did. And uh, another gooder. uh, Had a lot of fun. It was well received. The money from this is crazy. I just walk in after a show and I roll around in it. Uh, I don't even, you know... But um, no, all was all went well, and now the work begins for next month. And we also are still releasing episodes of the podcast version Excellent. of our show. How are you? What's going on with you? Your band has played eighteen states since last I spoke. Yeah, your uh, your tour eighteen states. Your U.S. No, we went- tour. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. We did all right. It was it was fun, and uh, we just finished has to be Patty's, a busy time Patty's for your week. band. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was about to say. This, this lineup has been the best, it's, I think, of all the touring groups that we've had because we just, we're just we just all so easy to get along with. That's the and good stuff. we enjoy stuff. each other's company. So, yeah, it's it's nice to have. So it's it's not exactly like the song uh, Turn the Page, the, the, the classic. <laughs> <laughs> On a long in the highway east of Omaha. Um, Wait, that, joke, one of those that song has come up as a joke many times, actually. Of it's course, funny. yeah. What's no. there's that part in the song where he walks into oh anytime he goes into a diner people stare at him for his long hair and they're like what are you doing here long haired yeah. man yeah he's a rocker guy such a rough life he had but anyway so uh I'm glad to catch up good to see you I, I'm really hoping that um that our world will change for the better soon because everything is scary outside the window. But we at least are off in our little head uh, in enjoying what we always enjoyed. Uh, what have you been watching lately? Well, uh, <laughs> well, I mentioned, well, I mentioned uh, <laughs> the time machine. You're and, desperate uh, to bring back Charles Nelson, right? <laughs> I love that well. guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I was watching, you, you mentioned the, the new season of Mandalorian. Um, and mm. I, when I when I mentioned the time machine to you, I had this thought for a second. I said, "What? What? What got me on that?" Because it was when we were on tour that this occurred to me. That is, uh, that was very out of left field. What was that about? Yeah. So what happened? Well, I was watching the s- second episode of th- this new season of The Mandalorian. Yeah. And I was watching on my phone in a hotel room. <laughs> I can't remember in Alabama or something. I can't remember where Again, I was. Again, that part was left out of the song, Turn the Page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watching the latest episode, The Mandalorian. Oh, I don't it understand easy why being a rocker. Grover's back. I'm all alone in a hotel room watching Mando. That I think that was the episode, I think it was episode two, where he goes to Mandalore. And, mm-hmm. and he encounters these cave creatures. Yeah. yeah. And he, he encounters these these cave creatures who reminded me very much of Morlocks from George Powell's yes, uh, the Time Machine. Yes, they did. They did look a lot like the, the classic from uh, George Powell's Time Machine, the Morlocks, yeah. which were a great design. Which has long been one of my favorite movies, and I hadn't thought about it in such a long time. I bought this DVD yeah. probably twenty over twenty years ago. Yeah, and um, of course, I've read the novel. Uh, I need to reread it. It's been a while since I've read it. It's a short I've read. Also, yeah, it is very short. And I've also read this this fantastic, uh, actually authorized sequel, uh, written by Stephen Baxter. He was actually authorized by the H.G. Wells estate wow. to do an official sequel, which is. Much longer, <laughs> yeah, than yeah. the original book, but it's it's really imaginative and just a lot of fun. Oops, and it's falling apart. <laughs> did did he did he give a name to the time traveler? To the time traveler, yeah. sort of, um, mm. because he it, it's a very twisty, turny time travel story. So he uh, he uh, he encounters a young his a younger version of himself a couple of times, of course, and he assigns the name Moses to him, and I can't remember if that uh. was actually 
his real name or just a given name they came up with to, to, to tell the two of them apart? You know, also Time Machine and and uh, uh, the Time Traveler and multiple versions and Doctor Who. It's also Kang. It all. I mean, time travel in in all science fiction. Technically, I don't know if it starts with Wells. I mean, certainly that being early sci-fi, there have to have been some sort of conceptual folkloric time travel stories, but that's like the first sci-fi it seems to be the general consensus yeah, that, that he it was, starts there he's the father of it yeah and now it's such a trope and everyone has done it and it becomes such a big part of star trek and i know that we're both watching picard season three right now there is so much time travel and sometimes sometimes it bugs me it has mm-hmm. to be done well because it yeah. is such such an easy out or i'm stuck for a story idea oh i know time travel yeah. but um Here's an example of people that really overused it, which is 90s on X-Men comics. While Chris Claremont was still writing it, he really just doubled and tripled down. Like almost every other storyline was, I'm Kitty Pride from the future, or hi, I'm Bishop, I'm from the future, I've got to stop things. And then it's like, hi, I'm Cable, I'm also from the future. I'm the son of Cyclops and, and Jean Grey, but but not the one that you know. I'm a different... Hi, I'm Rachel Summers. I'm also a daughter of theirs, but from a different time. And you're like, calm the fuck down with timelines. <laughs> but if you go back to the original, which is really H.G. Wells, almost every single piece of science fiction he wrote was not just for the cool ideas. He was sitting there trying to make allegories and you know their their morality tales so time machine it gets cliche now it seems cliche but back then it was just sort of like don't you understand what he's saying the past wasn't as golden and it's not changeable and the future is we have to change things now because the future we're going to be all fucked up i mean mm-hmm. the eloy and the morlocks this is real basic stuff is like this is a warning of where we're headed, but it's a great tale. Yeah. Uh, and I do like the, the fifties movie. I I'm not a fan of the remake. No, I did. And I rewatched that a couple of nights ago too, just cause I oh, wanted to refresh did? my memory on it. I went to go see it when it came out. I was kind of excited to see it when it came out, whenever it was 2002 and yeah, it was not good. <laughs> I, I, can I do another good. Brendan tie in story? And I'm yeah, sorry, I have it. so many of them. Well, <laughs> they shot it at Warner Brothers and I was there during the my tour. Guide. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, yeah. I really didn't see much of the activity, yeah. but they during one of the holiday hiatuses when the lot's pretty empty and they gave us the keys, which basically meant when you're taking your tours around, you can go into sound stages because they're not working. So I went into the Time Machine uh, soundstage, which was uh, soundstage 16, the big one. And the Time Machine was just sitting there. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) I mean, it was like one of the cavern sets. It was like a cave and it's just sitting there. Okay, yeah. And my tour is like, you know, they're blown away because it's a film set. There's just no one there. And they're like, wow, look at this. I'm like, yeah. And I was like, damn, that's the Time Machine. It's sitting right there and it's solid. It's really cool looking. I will say the design in that movie is cool. Oh, yeah. But but I was like, I kind of want to go sit in it. And my tour, mm. they were like going, do it, do Brendan, it. do it. <laughs> and I was like, OK, you guys just don't tell anybody. I did the same <laughs> thing on the wet. I did the same thing on the West Wing set. I was like, I really want to sit in the president's chair in the Oval Office. And they're like, do it. <laughs> I did. Brandon, I sat. Brandon. I sat. I put my feet up on the Oval Office desk. It was pretty great. But anyway. Ooh. Yeah, it, and it's a it was a gorgeous set. Are there it pictures looked, of these incidents? No. Is there any? <laughs> no, that would not. Well, also there were no pictures allowed no on the cameras, tour. Please. Yeah, that's that's how the tours worked because you're going to be seeing production, and they they did not want you taking pictures. So uh, I, a tour I set, like a a tour of like a forensic artist who like. <laughs> yeah. <Here's these> <laughs> I was like, just, hey, just one more you're, second, you're Mr. Jones. Hand me the sketchbook. Hand me. <laughs> That sketchbook. Sorry, um, no, no one was doing sketches. That would have been awesome, though. 
Uh, I went down, I sat in the time machine, and it was so well made, Chad. That thing was like a huge metal sculpture. And the dials, they're operable. Mm -hmm. So I set it to my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) I put March 25th, 1969 and got the hell out of there. Uh, and I mean, whether or not anyone ever, I'm sure when they came back to film, they're like, who fucked God the time it. machine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All they had to do was go tick, 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 put it right back. But uh, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I saw the movie when it came out. I was like, oof. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, I'd forgotten how. I mean, I no remember offense being- to Guy Pierce, so I've always liked that guy's great. He is he, this 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 is one of my quibbles with the movie, and there, there's plenty more to, to uh, take you got more shots than just at the film quibble. for. There's a lot of more complaints. I, I you know I know he's a good actor, but in this role, the way he he decides he's going to play the character, I don't know, maybe it wasn't his decision; could have been the director that he's going to play it as like a bumbling, socially awkward professor character, which is totally the opposite of what uh, Rod Taylor was doing in the original. But he just doesn't really seem to know how to do that. He's kind of like oh. Oh, <laughs> like this for the first half of the film. And it's like, it just didn't, it I just agreed. felt really forced. Well, the, the, the take and wasn't that one. Oh, it was directed by, by what, Simon his, Wells. Yeah. Simon Wells. Yeah. Which is sad. Man, that like, makes it hurt even worse. I know. Yeah. But it just seemed like a, it seemed like a, a bad take. It just, it was a really, was like, Yeah. A misguided reimagining of, of the story. Like they, they give him a different motive for tra- for inventing or discovering time travel and building the time machine. It's because he's, he's trying to prevent, go back in time to prevent the death of his fiance right. who's murdered in Central Park. Well, that's and that's so movie making where they're like weird. going, it can't just be intellectual curiosity. It exactly. can't be. The, they're like, we have to do. That's you see it all the time in these screenwriting books, which is one of the reasons I go. A little bit of that shit goes a long way, but we have to make it a personal journey that everyone can relate to. And it's more personal if it's because of the death of a loved one or something like, yeah, but then it becomes stock. And that's the problem. It's actually much more interesting to see one totally driven only by intellectual curiosity. (laughs) And that is what makes the Powell film and the original novel so gripping to me. And Rod Taylor, he's so... Fucking good. Oh, in that I love role. Rod Taylor. This is only a small experimental model, of course. To carry a man, a larger edition is needed. To carry a man? Where? Into the past or into the future? This is a time machine. He's he's underrated. Oh, and damn. uh yeah. Well, I'm not really underrated. It's just that other icons are bigger. But he was always solid, and he's really good in that. Yeah. And it's a... Uh, it is a thing where it's just like speaking of, of classics of that early literature, Jekyll and Hyde. There's, there's a uh, point not only about, Oh, should you dabble with God's work and blah, blah, blah. But it's really about also that kind of arrogance and that sort of unchecked, I know there might be consequences, but I can't stop myself. I find that to be a relatable emotion. It's like, okay, guys, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with I have to save my lost love, but stop. We got enough of that bullshit. Yeah. Um, And science fiction, part of its characters, a lot of its heroes in early science fiction is it has nothing to do with that kind of world building. It's only about conceptually I am obsessed and it's always about a scientist or a thinker. And someone is like, you know, fates be damned. I have to know. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And uh, yeah, I love it. And then he, he, he conveys this sense of euphoric wonder at yeah. this thing that he's developed and he's he's so he but he also wants to connect with people he's like he wants his friends to understand how amazing yeah. this is yeah and much to and he's heartbroken when he realizes they don't believe him and you're i'm, I'm sitting there thinking just show him the real machine like 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 malcolm mcdowell's sure. character did sure of course, he didn't even demonstrate it they could have demonstrated it for him on the, on the moment but uh the the dialogue in that scene and it's very much the same in the novel 
Oh, that you'll have to refresh me because I did not catch up. Like I really wanted to. I, well, he, I haven't watched it in years, but I love but it. This is the thing that makes the original movie so wonderful. This is 1960, and they start oh, off the movie right. in this this heavy intellectual conversation about the fourth dimension. Why is it that we usually ignore the fourth dimension? Because we have no freedom of movement within it. Yeah. And he gets into an argument. Like one of his friends is arguing with it. You can't. This is ridiculous, and and it gets heated. You know, and Rod Taylor's character is going, no, time changes space. Don't you understand? <laughs> the same space that's here now should be here in a hundred or even a thousand years. No, now. Philip, time changes space. And it, gets, <laughs> it gets like, you know, very passionate discussion. And in the novel, um, I'm gesturing back here because it's sitting up here. Yeah. The, uh, what what the does George debate. Harrison have to do with it? <laughs> yeah, right, right. In the novel that George Harrison that. wrote. No, no. <laughs> In, in the in the novel, the same way in, as in the movie, he brings out a little miniature version of the time machine to right, demonstrate. Yes. Says, yeah. "Check this out." He puts a lever, a lever, and it disappears. In the novel, they don't do this in the movie, but in the novel, one of the his friends argues with him, say, "Well, if it's traveling to the future, why can't we still see it? it clearly, it's traveling through these points in time to get to wherever it's going in the future." And it's like that's really heavy, heavy discussion. Yeah. And they yeah. and they they figure out they you know they they find an answer, they address that. And it's just it's just wonderful, and they and they don't have that argument in the movie, but they do have. Well, if it's occupying the same space, it, well, why can't I feel it? You must remember that the space you're putting your hand through is today's space. These pretty heavy conceptual, uh, you know, philosophical. Well, they're trying to debates. make. I mean, I mean, fourth dimensional travel, and I mean, they weren't talking wormholes back then, but but they're such big concepts, and and it was well done on Wells's part and also very well done on Powell's part is how do I feed this to the general masses? I'm not a physicist. You know, yeah. it's like, I've, I've certainly read articles on new developments and I go, uh, I understood 70% of that. And even that's pretty great for me, but it's still, uh, worth making something explained and explainable instead of just pretending it's magic which movies yeah. could have done. He goes, I would tell you how it works, but I don't have time for that. Instead, yeah. they're making the attempt. Like, here is the big concept boiled down, and then they get it. And then you get visuals, which, of course, in George Powell, you know, War of the Worlds and uh, and Time Machine both. I'm, I'm, I love those movies. But um, just the visual, and it's still such a great effect of the sped up, Mm -hmm. um, passage through time where you watch and plus they keep cutting to his expressions of just going like, I can't believe this. Shit. Yes. Again, but you Bar see, Taylor buildings just totally go up. It. you see yeah. him come down, you see, you mm -hmm. see trees grow from nothing. And, and it's just, it's just great. It's a mm -hmm. perfect way to visualize it. Stationary in space, fluid in time. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I have to say, I think too, for the, for the, the misguided sequel we were just talking or remake we were just talking about. They did convey that part of it pretty well. I thought where he is sure. traveling through time, where he finally gets to the part where he's going into the far future. Yeah. And he, and he takes the time to be amazed at what's happening. Like he didn't do the first time. Cause it is <laughs> anyway. First time he's like, the, yeah, I saw the pal movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They oh, did do wait, it. what's this? Yeah. That sequence where he's going to the future was a pretty nice homage to the original film. I thought yeah. and there's several moments like that throughout the film, but there's the other thing too is like they they say well we got to give him a real motive for for uh creating time travel is because he's trying to resurrect his fiance or prevent uh, her, her death there's also a thing too like why does he travel to the year 800 and 2000 well that's um, tricky chad <laughs> in the i can't remember in the novel why he if there's a reason why but in the movie the, the george powell version he gets encased in lava at one point so he just keeps pushing ahead trying to yeah. see if the lava would break away and he, and it doesn't wind up happening until hundreds of thousands of years in the future. In yeah. the Guy Pierce film, he just gets knocked unconscious. <laughs> like He's he's asleep all the way through it, and, and it ruins the tension because it, you you see in the in the George Powell version he's like pushing head going damn it I can't stop because then I won't you know and he didn't say that but I think the implication is he can't stop until he's got breathable air oh to, oh so he has to keep pressing ahead I prayed 
wondering how many centuries, how many eons must pass before the wind and rain could wear away the mountain that enclosed me. Otherwise, he's going to be trapped. And finally, he breaks free. He's like, I'm free. <laughs> and then he winds up in the Eloy Morlock world. But that's a lot more tense. And it's just so weird. Like, after it takes like half an hour, 40 minutes before we even see the time machine in the Guy, Guy Pierce in the uh, the 2002 remake. That's, that's right. That's right. It and takes then a they long just kind of gloss over all the the moments of tension. And, and I don't know. It's just there's so many things that were just poorly thought out in that film. Anyway, and the the uh, the 60 version, it throws a lot of it at you and it never lags. Is it yeah. kind of cartoony to look at now simply because of the time, the technicolor and all that? Yeah. Uh, but is it still engaging? Yeah, I love it. And I love it, yeah. Mimi. Mimi. You. Yvette yeah. Mimi. I think that's how you're supposed to say her name. Mimi. <laughs> With a long pause afterwards. Yeah. Yvette Mimi. <laughs> uh, she's lovely. That was like one of her breakouts, her first English language kind of breakout. But um, she's actually yeah. born in Los Angeles. She's what? Uh, her father was French. She's a. Uh, she herself is American. I, I just realized well, this was Fran- a French or original language. Cause she does have an accent or maybe that was just her growing up with, you know, a French father. That could be I, the interview I saw. She doesn't really have an accent. I was wondering that too. I was like, isn't she oh, French? Cause I thought, did they goes, dub her voice? Yeah. But no, here's that- the thing. When a uh, pal called me, I said, uh, <laughs> what will I be wearing? Something diaphanous. And he said, yeah, you know, like a short skirt. I was like, okay. But uh, you keep the Morlocks away from me. It's in my contract. They cannot touch me. Okay? <laughs> that's yeah. that's how she really sounded. <laughs> and she, yeah. And she, by the way, she turned 18 on the set while she, when she was oh, filming. Oh, wow. This. this is one of these these very, not, not as disparate as like, uh, what's his name? You wrote a song about him. Fred Astaire, Fred Astaire, and oh, you're the young talking actress, about a funny face. Where they're like forty years Audrey apart. Hepburn? Yeah, yes. now, it's here's not the quite thing. that disparate. I, I, I think- will defend funny face, but the thing that you just can't ever buy, no matter how talented these people are, you cannot buy a romance between young Audrey Hepburn <laughs> and Fred Astaire, who yeah. was already in his early sixties or late fifties at that point. You're like, wow. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. So in the yeah. time machine, Rod Taylor's 30, I believe. Yvette Mimu is 18. So that's still a little it's, weird. Well, but it's, it's you know, it's, time. it's Hollywood. Yeah. And this this brings me to um, well, well, I'm sure we'll jump back and forth between these two movies, but whoa, the whoa. time after time, the uh, the movie which was sort of like a reimagining. Oh, is of, that what you wanted to talk about? Because I thought you wanted to talk them. about the REM song. <laughs> yeah but i just Man listened to that for a co- no they, they did one that was time after time oh they did really well at least that's the chorus is that the name of the song maybe not i always think of the cindy time Lampert. after time, time after time. something time i guess uh, was it one of their later songs is it, no is it? early oh sorry yeah yeah that's uh time after time yeah what's that one I guess I'm yeah, going right. to look it up because I, I thought that I thought it had a different title, but you're probably right. It's probably a yeah, different that's on reckoning. Yeah, that's a great song. It is. Uh, I forgot that was it's a actually time. called time after time. Wow. And at least I not remember is that. the subtitle. Yeah, and I love yeah, that song. It is so good. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> now I've lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, yeah. We were talking about Time After Time, which yeah. is a, such a delightful movie. And again, yeah. I'm sorry that my schedule did not allow me to rewatch. But Malcolm McDowell, David Warner, Mary Steenburgen. You take those three people, put them in any movie, I want to watch it. Mm-hmm. But is it H.G. Wells chasing Jack the Ripper? That goes right into my vein. And this is what I was saying in my message to you. That like, I was thinking I about that. I don't know if you like, can see it, but that's my vein. Oh. Yeah, and that's it where is. it's going. It's going right yeah. in there. Okay. Yeah. I um, love that movie. Yeah, I, I do too. And it's it's despite all its faults too, because I, I want to see, I want to oh, get the- Oh, it's not uh, perfect. <laughs> no, no. And even and Nicholas Meyer, who went on mm-hmm. to do amazing things, um, this was the first movie he'd actually directed. 
but he also wrote it. And he also, and it came, it's a really interesting way it came about because it was a friend of his who was right, who had started writing the novel. He was only like 50 pages into it or something. So here, what do you think? And he's like, this is great. I want to make it a movie. Okay, cool. So they developed it kind of side by side, kind of similar to the way Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke did uh, 2001. It's so funny that, that the concept didn't start with Meyer because Meyer is, yeah. he's been a lot of things over his career, but he's one of the original and greatest Sherlockania authors who wrote uh, right. Extended Adventures of Sherlock Holmes as novels. And then a lot of, they got adapted as films because mm -hmm. uh, the 7% solution. Universal presents the 7% solution. Nicholas Meyer's best-selling mystery from the personal memoirs of Dr. John H. Watson. Which is Sherlock Holmes with Alan Arkin playing Sigmund Freud. Come on, that's great stuff. First, you must tell me how you guess the details of my life with such uncanny accuracy. Yeah, he did a he did so many Sherlock Holmes novels, and of course, he's very educated on that time period. That he's a natural to have directed this, but it surprised me to find out the idea wasn't his originally. That's true. Mm -hmm. He wrote the script, but he was just like you said, he was basing it off the the book that wasn't finished yet. Well, he also, of course, gave us the greatest Star Trek film of all time. Yeah, Rath right, right. Rathi Khan was only just a few years after that. Yeah. And, and Star Trek Four and six. Yes. No, he did a lot of Star Trek. I But I always want to, you know, the best one ever Yeah, is him. Yeah. And he also wrote Invasion of the Bee Girls. So we need to talk about <laughs> Wow. I, don't, I wasn't aware of that one. I've seen that one. It's, um, it's very 1973. Invasion of the Bee Girls. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, and it's, it's funny you mentioned Sherlock too because they do this little sort of Easter egg mention of when he tr he uses the name Sherlock, they just try to use a different name, not realizing that Sherlock is a household name. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, I see. Go on. In yes. 1979. And he's later, he's like, shit. Um, <laughs> that was a great, great moment. But one of the things I, I noticed, I, I didn't really realize this until I was watching rewatching the time machine the original last night because I watched time after time a couple nights ago and then I was watching this the, I'm glad the you classic. spaced them out because too much at once e too that's not at healthy once. that's not healthy. but but they make a big deal about uh women's liberation and time after time and right it's it's sort of a plot point that 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 Mary Steenburgen's character is pretty aggressive you know she's the one who asked she asked him out right yeah uh, sort of at his behest, but she chooses the restaurant they go to. She doesn't close her eyes when they're kissing all these things. And she's yeah. just very aggressive and confident in a way that he's not used to seeing women act that way from his time. You compare that to the original film and in that movie, we've got Weena who was like, just basically uh, a child. Yeah. yeah. But, but very like, I don't know. What do you, well, that's also <laughs> the whatever you think. And that's, I know all that's all how they all are. are like, we're all children and so bright eyed and we can't Abs even protect ourselves. Absolutely. But it was also sort of this Hollywood cliche at the time to have yes. this very coquettish, doe eyed uh, female yeah. lead with a strong, confident male. I'll, 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 you know, follow me. I'll, I'll, I'll protect you. And well, not only stuff. is that, a, the, you know, clever use of, because when you do time travel thing, the whole point is to show the differences, show what, the person wherever they're from contemporary or from the past and they come here or they go in the future always to, to highlight the differences. But the thing is um, it's also really clever use because, and Meyer would have known that is HG Wells famously was a real progressive thinker. Yeah. Uh, he was all for his time period. And it wasn't just about sci-fi. He was, he was writing, um, tracks and essays about uh social fiction social science fiction where you know it's like look it's equality of the sexes free love the death of of monogamy he was basically very like dude let's all just do what feels good yeah <laughs> he was he was a poly dude he would have been like these are not my wives we're all just in a big old happy family that fucks but i mean that's kind of what he he kind of was 
bucking against the restrictive Victorian era he lived in because Mm -hmm. he saw its faults and he saw that, you know, so in a way he was a science fiction writer past all the aliens and time travel. It was about ideas and, and society. So I liked that. And they do address that in time after time, as I remember in both movies. Yeah. All right. If you want to know the truth, I don't much care for the time I was born into. It seems people aren't dying fast enough these days. They call upon science to invent new, more efficient weapons to depopulate the Earth. Within three generations, the social utopia will have come to pass. There'll be no more war, no crime, no poverty, and no disease either, John. Men will live like brothers and on terms of perfect equality with women as well. Oh dear, let's have the past. (laughs) And Malcolm McDowell is very, because that is a, another, he's such a good actor. He has played all kinds, he's played psychotics and da da da, but he comes off very charming and lovable and lost as H.G. Wells in the modern day of 1979. And That's, the fact that yeah. he was dating Mary Steenburgen for a long period at that time, mm-hmm. um, their chemistry is just spot on. Well, they got yeah, so it works that. as a, yeah, yeah, and it works yeah. as a love story. It, yeah. And then you have David Warner's Jack the Ripper, and that's all I need. Yeah. Oh, Again, he's so, so he's good. so great. I um, love the way he just and and I've seen other time travel movies do that, where the villain is usually the one that is not so thrown by like being put in a different world or different time, where yeah, he's like going, like, I "Oh here, my yeah. god, this is great." Yeah. I belong here completely and utterly. I'm home. It's you who do not belong here. Yeah. He's like, I'm a serial killer in, in this society, and oh, it's made for me. Look at all and, the prostitutes I can kill. Sorry, sex workers. Sorry, sex workers. <laughs> I think, and in both of these, both movies, the original and and this, uh, and time after time, both movies have that 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 heavy philosophical conversation in the beginning, talking about the, the basic concepts of time travel. Also, why the character of Wells wants to travel into the future. And by the way, I'd forgotten this. I thought it was like a, you know, kind of an interesting fun conceit that they actually took, you know, time after time. He's not just the time traveler. He actually is the H- very explicitly the HD yeah. Wells. Yeah. Uh, who hasn't written his novels yet. He's like a younger version of him. It's like you, he, when he actually gets to the museum is exhibit in San Francisco dedicated to him. He sees an older picture of the actual HD Wells who's started balding. And he looks at it. Oh, goes, right. He looks at it and goes, never. <laughs> <laughs> but in the, I, I remembered this. I thought it was like the novel where they just don't give him a name. His name is George in the movie, the, the George Powell movie. Yeah, but if you look Herbert at the console George of the Wells. time machine, yeah, yeah, it says manufactured by H. George Wells. Like, oh, yes. they did it too. <laughs> they they did. don't make a big deal out of that, but he is H. D. Wells. But yeah, well, one of the things I, I told you about in the, in the uh, message when I – first proposed this idea was just how ahead of its time in a way uh the um nicholas myers film was that you've you've got these two sort of one's a serial killer but essentially two pop culture icons no that's it yeah kind of mashed together as a sort of this pop 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 culture mashup in a way and it reminds me very much of a lot of the kind of crazy ideas that we've had in graphic novels and movies in more recent decades um, well, it's I think, kind of amazing the movie got made, and of course it was with a very low budget. But it, you know, I have no idea if Nicholas Meyer was familiar with his work, but it's very, it's it's very much like Philip Jose Farmer. Philip Jose Farmer, science science fiction fantasy author, who back in the sixties and seventies, he's kind of the guy that I attribute this whole like. Um, monster mash idea of fiction because he very good writer, but essentially was one of our greatest fan fiction authors is what I always say. Okay. Because back then he was the guy, well, the most famous thing he came up with was river world, which is sort of a a limbo between life and death where you die and you go there and you are mingling with, all the famous people from history, but also fictional characters that are, are 
real beings. And so you have Mark Twain standing next to Robin Hood and over there is King Arthur next to, you know, Abraham Lincoln and all kinds of just stuff. And you're like, oh, and it sounds ludicrous, but it all works. And it's just highly imaginative. He was also a huge pulp fan, obviously. And that was my in with Philip Jose Farmer because he did a fictional biography of Tarzan called Tarzan Alive. And it was basically him reading all the Edgar Rice Burroughs books and then providing like an actual biography, but also a biography with the conceit that Tarzan had been a real person who uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs met and changed his name. It's like, yeah, Lord Greystoke, in real life, his name wasn't Greystoke. It was this. But he handed off like journals and diaries to Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote all those novels. That's And Philip Jose Farmer then expands that by connecting Tarzan to other fictional characters, it, like they're real, and it becomes a family tree. He did one for Doc Savage, where it finds out that Doc Savage and Tarzan are cousins, and they're related to Fu Manchu and Sherlock Holmes and everybody you could ever imagine. And they called it the Wold Newton universe. Wold Newton is a little village in England, a real one. And there was a meteor strike there in the 1780s or something. And Philip Jose Farmer's entire fictional universe is based on the idea that that actual meteor strike was witnessed by a couple of carriages full of people uh, who were traveling through the country and that the radiation from that meteor strike made all of their descendants special. So he has ancestors of James Bond and Sherlock Holmes and all these people being in those carriages, the Scarlet Pimpernel, Zorro. I mean, it's just, and so eventually he basically had this whole family tree where every great character you could imagine, not only have they met, but they're probably distant cousins from each other. So I love that stuff. And then of course, later, obviously Nicholas Meyer doing the same thing by having Sherlock Holmes and Sigmund Freud meet and da, 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 and time after time. And then you get Alan Moore with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which is just taking it to the nth degree and turning that into a graphic novel, which again, talk about the crack that I live off of. I loved it right up to the end, even though he, he lost a lot of people by the end of the mini, mini series of, because it kept going away from having a solid story. And then it just became him. The last stuff with him basically shitting on JK Rowling and Harry Potter. I'm like, what? It's weird stuff. Hmm. But I love the, especially the first two mini series of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I love this stuff. It's just like me with my dolls going, (laughs) me with my dolls. That's right. What if Thanos (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Met Captain Crunch. Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm working on it right now. <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. Hey, don't do that. I'm going to do it. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I need to work a little on the dialogue. What do you think it's going on? Don't do it, man. I'm going to do it. Put that glove down. <laughs> Not going to put the glove down. <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll get better. It'll get better. Trust me. But uh, I love I'm, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's to me, I mean, it was just incredibly sort of, uh, sort of, uh, precognitively, uh, nerdy <laughs> or yeah, it, yeah. it was, it was prescient to what, what the word is for looking ahead to the, to the future of nerdiness in uh, in uh, comics. There was also, and this wasn't Nicholas Meyer, but there was also, um, also in the seventies. Cause I think maybe that's when this kind of stuff was brewing, but there was also, um, murder by decree which was Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper. No time travel, but that was another oh. one. Uh, that was Christopher Plummer, I believe, as as, um, as Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, so, I mean, anytime wow. they do that stuff where it's like, H.G. Wells meets blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes, have them meet, have them team up. Oh, and I remember now one of the things I forgot what I was going to say earlier. Oh, good. I, both of these movies, <laughs> both of these movies uh, very artfully skirt around the question of how do the machines actually work? They spend a lot of yeah. time talking about the concepts behind the science, but they kind of dazzle you with that. Yes. And they, we never like Rod Taylor's 
H.G. Wells never talks about how the machine actually works. Nobody even asks him how it works. Which, it's kinda, that's a sci-fi get, thing, too, because yeah. uh, very, very many literary scholars think that the entire genre of science fiction uh, didn't start with Verne. They actually call Frankenstein the original science fiction novel. Okay. Uh, so Mary Shelley yeah. kicked it off. And sure, that sounds legit, but it, I, I reread Frankenstein the novel fairly recently, and I had forgotten how all the stuff, so much of the iconic stuff from the Frankenstein story was from the movies and stuff that happened later. In her book, she is real vague about how he puts the creature together. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, he found pieces of dead bodies, and she describes it almost like it's alchemy, almost like black magic. Because there's no lightning, there's no like uh, storm and haul them up, you know, that kind of thing. So it, she jumps around it too. She's like going, he did some shit. And the next morning, uh, and you're yeah. like, great. <laughs> but uh, um, also she had him talk. He, he's intelligent, but, um, but, but it did, it does lead to what, and I, I do this because I, I enjoy doing this and it doesn't mean well, you are a science less. minded guy. I bet you yeah. were sitting there racking your brain, figuring out how but it worked. Both movies have things you can poke holes in the way it works. Although I will say the time of the original George Powell's original is much more consistent and, and a little bit more stalwart in the way that it conveys what's happening. It's, there's not a whole lot of holes you can poke in what happens as long as you accept the fact that the machine works as described and, right. and displayed. And <laughs> there's a lot of weird things in time after time that I like. I like the fact that when he travels into the future, he winds up wherever the machine is in the future. And that's kind of yeah. interesting, but it does yeah. pose a lot of questions like, well, what if somebody just destroyed the machine? I know. You know, it just, it doesn't really make sense. Maybe, well, that, maybe, that interesting. Would have been a, maybe that would have been a thing, not that they needed to put something like that in there, but that could have been a thing where just like you were describing, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like he, there's no atmosphere. So he has to keep moving almost as if the machine is self-protecting. Mm -hmm. So, or you're kind of in a, a bubble as you move, but maybe if it got to a point where it in the present or that point in time is destroyed, maybe he can't go past that. So he's forced yeah. out right. right before the thing is destroyed or something. Yeah. But you know, the good point. Yeah. I did like that where it's it, like, he's, he's not in England because the machine isn't in England anymore. So he, and in the original movie, you're thinking like, wow, that pretty brass contraption that Rod Taylor's H.G. Wells built. No one thought to move that out of that basement ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like in that so basement well, and, and the World War II comes and, and then World War Three, And you're like, no one ever moved that thing. Well, in, the, in that movie, they, they established that if the, if the machine doesn't land in that time, it's not there. You can't no, yeah. see it. So, yeah. yeah. So they, they avoid that question. They, but, but time after time, very, very confidently strolls into this very shaky ground as far as a, a narrative uh, device having yeah. the machine kind of travel. And he's just, with that's why they're in San Francisco. But I like it's it though, because the, he, yeah. He, he show, yeah, that's why they're in San Francisco, but also that's why the, 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 uh, the security guard is like, well, you people again, get out of the machine, you know? Hey, you. Get away from that exhibit. Where do you think you are? Disneyland? Yeah. Because you like, realize later so you he's the second guy, guy that, that he's caught in the machine. You people. Right. Almighty. So I, I like that. And the fact that he's able to, it's just, it's totally silly. The fact that he's able to get a pair, a spare pair of glasses out of his oh, drawer. Right. His test. Yes. It's so silly, but I just love but it because it just works. That, that so. works in a comic book way. And, yeah. and I'm not going to worry too much about it. It is yeah. neat that he's like on, well, shit, that's my desk. And if they, let me see. <laughs> yeah. My there glasses they are. are still there a hundred years later, whatever. <laughs> I love it too. Oh, yeah. I forgot Eight that part. Time differences was just because of the time zones. It's very clever. Yes. Little, little touch. But again, they don't, he doesn't actually say in dialogue, oh, of course it's followed the, the course of the object through time. So it, here it is in the future. So that's why he doesn't say it. He just goes, Oh, and you, you just kind of go there with him, you know? Yes. But, but if you, if you think about it too much, it kind of falls apart. As we've already well, discussed. I'm going to say this, and here's a, a very hot take. You think too much about any time travel, anything, and you sit there going, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, no. Well, especially Unless with it's all about every, just like a lot of string theory and quantum theory, it's like the thing with alternate universes is every single choice 
splits off and it's truly infinite. So in other words, you don't have to worry about paradoxes because whatever past he went back to, that's not the past of his actual timeline. He has now created a whole other one that he which, can fuck up to his heart's delight. Which is explained very well. It's one of my favorite things about Endgame is where they... yes. Where uh, the Hulk, it's uh, Mark Ruffalo's character, is explaining, "No, you moron, that's not how time travel works." So, <laughs> yeah, think about it. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past, which can't now be changed by your new future. Exactly. So, Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit. Wait, so Back to the Future is bullshit? Yes. <laughs> and it's, it, it was just a, the great that that one little bit of nerdy dialogue just helped the movie so much. Although they did kind of get a little weird with it later with the way that this, uh, this total, oh, total sure. here, but what happens with, with uh, captain America later? Yeah. At the end of I the mean, movie? he had a wonderful life, but it clearly wasn't in the MCU universes. It couldn't past. have been. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't have been. And, and apparently the filmmakers were divided on this. Like the writers say, yeah, that was, he was in the, the MCU universe. And while and the, that, uh, that Peggy Carter just pretended that, that he had died right. for the rest of her. Yeah. He just, just up. Oh, I can't help anybody because I've already been here, and you guys handle it. I have to hide in, in incognito for the rest of my life, or until yeah, he would have just hung back and let the world deal it, with shit, so he could keep Bone and Peggy. Right. I will say the motivation there. <laughs> yeah. So, so apparently the writers of the, the script writers uh, said, "Yeah, that's what happens." The Russo brothers said, "No, no, it's a it's an alternate universe. Obviously, that's I, I, so they, they weren't I in agreement think over that's that, the thing. which makes more I, sense." I'm gonna side with the Russos on that. Yeah, because they've been waiting to hear my. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what is Brendan finally? Think? Where... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> validated, validated. The other thing, the other hole that I was having fun poking into time after times uh, time machine. Was that the, you know the, one of the, the MacGuffin? I guess you could call it of the film is that key, the the non the non right. return key, which isn't the key that operates the device. It's the key that prevents it from automatically returning to its origin. Right. Which again, with the whole thing with the with the time machine just kind of being wherever it is without history, why does that matter <laughs> anyway? Since it's always wherever it is or wherever it was, it's it's kind of weird. It, it doesn't well, make any no, sense. it's it's returning to its proper time not location but it's also right? still in the future in the museum so it's it's kind of uh, weird yeah so, yeah, so yeah. he could have taken the, the, the jack the ripper could have taken it john Le sorry john leslie stevenson could have taken it and gone <laughs> to another point in time if, if he managed to break back into the museum but you don't need the key to operate it because he, he goes just goes down there and steals the machine and travels to 1979 without any key or anything and then you see the re you read when he gets to the when hg wells shows up in the exhibit in 1979 and looks at the uh, plaque describing yeah. what it is. It says like, is it, it's never, it's never known to have worked. Like, well, did you turn it on? <laughs> Cause <it's, laughs> it still works. So it's, it's a lot of it doesn't make any sense. Whereas in the time machine, he's got the little knob. It, it doesn't yeah. work without the little knob lever. He takes it off yeah. whenever he leaves the machine. That's like the key problem solved right there. Then that, that's very clean and neat, you know? And so they, they yeah. it's a strange idea they went with there. With with a non return Dude, key, you got to let it go. But they had I, obviously this they needed has been some bugging reason you why. since nineteen seventy nine. <laughs> you as a little kid just sitting there going like, "Wait a minute, hold on, someday I'll figure this out <laughs> on a podcast." <laughs> Hello, is this Mister Meyer? Yeah, my name is Chad Smalley. <laughs> I got big issues with you about the key. Sounds just like me. I I've been working on that, but um. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It's a great no. movie. It's H.G. Wells chasing after Jack the Ripper. And it he goes to a McDonald's. I remember that scene really well. I, I think that, yeah. And I think that's why the movie, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the movie is, has endured so well is that was one of the greatest things about it was it's a fish out of water story, which of yes. there are many movies like that, but they pull it off so well <laughs> in this and in this, in this particular movie, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, and I, but I think it's mostly Malcolm McDonald's performance that makes it it's so endearing. It's his performance, but I will also say, from the writing standpoint, what was really smart, because if you have a high concept, and the high concept is H.G. Wells versus Jack the Ripper in the modern day, you could have really made it a chase thriller uh, kind of story with a sci-fi element, but what was so smart was just all the character work it giving room 
for having an H.G. Wells being lost and amazed and things like that and, and actually showing the impact. Anybody who time travels back or forward, that is wonder. That is and and it's important that you show that that's when time travel stuff you don't worry about the i don't worry about how a tardis works i don't it's just like it just it, you get yeah. there and you show what it means yeah uh oh i got a question for you and this is a high concept question yes if you could time travel where where would you go forward very back good question well hg which is it to be the past or the future? Oh, the past. Surely he'll want to meet Cleopatra. <laughs> the future. For my part, I intend taking a journey into the future. I would probably want to do both. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. With with the understanding that probably whatever I do in the past is going to result in an end game type of thing. Yeah. Meaning, meaning it's not going to change my future or whatever. No. Or my present. But I would love to go back to witness things that, that sure. I wish I was there for, like the Beatles in Hamburg or just go see my dad, you know, when he was in college or something oh, to see what he was dude, like, that yeah. type of thing. I would want to go back. I don't think course, I'd want to see my parents this is, in college. This is what everybody wants to see. I want to, I would want to go into the past, prevent John Lennon's death and then go forward 10 years to see what music he wrote. <laughs> you know, that type Fuck of thing. Yeah. I would do the same thing with Buddy thing. Holly. Yeah. Yeah. Any of them. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Because it's just sort of like, dude, you were just getting started and you were a genius and it probably would have been awesome and it would have changed music forever. Yeah. And the Beatles still would have happened. And I would want to go into the future too. Yeah. Uh, I would want to do what, what the time, what the time travel does in the novel and just go fucking millions of years into the future just to see what happens. I yeah. just want to see what happens as long as I yeah. can safely get back. <laughs> I'm That's down. the thing. Yeah. yeah. I would, I like, I have an affinity for, the thirties and forties and would love to dip into that era. Not a specific event. Really. I always just kind of want to walk that world. Would I show up sometime in 1938 and grab an action comics number one off the stands? Yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure I could <laughs> pony up the 10 cents. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that I would love that period. I would love to, check out frontier i know that's a cliche but you know some of that frontier americana stuff i would love the old west for about five minutes before the <laughs> smell got to me and i'm like jesus christ <laughs> yeah i would love I to mean, see any, all like this that. ancient rome i would love to see what that was Fuck really like yeah you know Fuck yeah but yeah um, not want to really spend time there i just want to no that's i mean some the uh, most of these things the wall. would be yeah. would be brief yeah. But yeah, yeah, I would definitely go see a show of, you know, the Beatles and definitely pre, you know, uh, stadium shows because I want to hear yeah. those motherfuckers. Yeah, I want to sit and have a conversation with them, you know. Yeah, have so beer, have probably it'd be Lennon. best to go back there to uh, yeah. the Reaper Bond or whatever and just like go, yeah, the, the rat's keller. I, I, I would want to be there you do right, as they're, right as they're getting the no Klaus Vorman and... and uh, uh huh. And what's your name? Uh, but you won't be meeting Ringo. It, they'd be it'd still be Pete. Well, he was around. They, 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 the, uh, oh, yeah, the he was. He was playing with his, uh, the bill for a while there. Yeah. Yeah. Not all the time, but I think they, they you'd were be there. like the guy going, like, you know, that Ringo guy's pretty good. Yeah, he's, you guys are I mean, no good offense to Pete. He's yeah. You know, have you checked out Ringo? <laughs> yeah. And about the bass player, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Meaning Stuart Cycle is not Paul McCartney. So. No, I know hey. who you're talking about. Uh, but but uh, moving forward, I'd be pretty much the exact same. I would. I think I'd love to do it in kind of uh, decades or 50 year periods. Like mm -hmm. I would love to hop and go. Wow, 50 years from where I am. Look at, it. and you know, until it ends up being the world in AI where all those freaky aliens are just us after we evolved. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're on that that track, <laughs> unless yeah. we kill ourselves, which is you know always a possibility. And one thing I want to jump back to, which okay, jump. Hope you lead to one of the last things we talk about. I think I talk about how the, this euphoric sense of wonder that this film gets. I can't think of a movie before the science fiction movie anyway bef before this one that kind of conveys. To me, it, it's the first film that I've seen that the early, earliest film I've seen, I should say that that evokes that kind of wonder that we later associated with people like Spielberg and Lucas mm. and uh, you know, Zemeckis and Richard Donner, all these people who were really good at using 
these tropes and you know really good performances really sort of wonderful uh uh fantastical setting but also with amazing musical scores written in this case by yeah. russell garcia and that th i that that theme the theme music in this movie well i'd have to refresh myself because yeah uh, Da 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 Very romantic, very sweet. Yeah, and it, but adventure, like just sort of adventurous kind of swelling in yeah. it. Yeah. And he, the way they convey it, like early in the film, after he has his, it's, you know, it's a whole movie's a flashback to when he has his first meeting with his friends and they're like, yeah, you're crazy right here. Have a good night. You know, Happy New Year. Cause it's New Year's Eve. And right. then he resolves that he's going to use the machine that night. And as soon as he, he, he doesn't say it, he sits down at his desk and he's furiously scribbling something and the music swells right as he's sitting down at the desk. You're like, oh, he's going, he's going. You know, you just feel this. <laughs> Come on, we're going to do it. We're well, going to do it. We're going to use say, it. There, you know, uh, scores are not what they were. They can still, no. of course, be amazing, but but classic Hollywood scores, and that's a 1960 movie, so that's already when this kind of thing is going out. Uh, we just um, on another podcast that I'm doing with John and my brother, where we watch Vincent Price movies. Um, mm -hmm. We started with House of Wax, which is from '53. And it was a lot of fun because I hadn't seen it in years, but it, real retro, it's not a great film. Vincent Price is great, but it's not a great film. But I, one of my comments was, dudes, that score went all out. And it's, it's not embarrassing because it fits, but at the same time, it's not afraid to be like majestic and bombastic and whatever Wonderful. for, um, you know, a Gothic horror story. And you're like, going, you just don't hear that shit anymore because it, people would roll their eyes, but I, I was all about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I miss. And you know, if you go back to, uh, what's his name? Corn gold. Is that his name? Like who did adventures of robin hood in the 40s that kind of stuff i could listen to that all day and it would make mm -hmm. my life seem like it's a grand adventure it's just <laughs> right. so great but no i but, agree um, i don't know if that's like um i'm sure that influenced people like spielberg but i'd say absolutely. some of those that era of sci-fi and fantasy um they did often uh not to the same degree because george powell's time machine and war of the worlds are their own thing mm -hmm. but things like fantastic voyage where they you know they get shrunk down and they're inside you know the body and as they're going like those are red blood cells and you know the music swells and they're all looking out the portholes just going wow we're in a body i mean it's cheesy but at the same time it's that a sense of adventure like we're doing yeah. some forbidden planet which is actually great still Leslie Nielsen. Um, but the whole idea of, of their work a day astronaut kind of people, everything's pretty serious, but anytime like that ship lands or something, or the robot comes out and there's just like this swell, it's just, mm -hmm. it is, it, it's a, it's a, a, a naivete, an allowance that we are okay with this kind of uh, that that's, allowing the common person to experience something magical. And I do mm -hmm. think that the advances of effects where we are now and that kind of stuff where anything you can imagine, you're going to see it. It's kind of dulled us a little to that. Yeah. I mean, the scene I was talking about is such a perfect example because it, there's no special effects in this scene. It's just Rod Taylor, a really good actor sitting down in a really nicely constructed set and a, and a perfectly uh, tailored costume for the period of time that they're in. And his performance of he's, he's he takes out an inkwell and he's like, you know, you're putting it dipping dip, dipping the uh, the pen in the ink inkwell and then yeah. scribbling and like this and because what it, he's you know, selling there, what the yeah. movie, the director, the score, all of it is selling is this is the step out the door. Yes. This is where it's like, and just the decision, and a cynic might then immediately have the machine blow up and he dies. But I mean, but, <laughs> but just the decision of like, um, that's it. 
it may cost me my life, but I have to know what's out there kind of thing. Yeah. I love that stuff. It goes to like me and you are suckers for uh, a heroic narrative. And, and we, I think both of us like it for that pure reason, not just because badass action will follow or some kind of monster is going to show up and it's going to get its ass handed to it. No, it's more about the spirit of like that adventurous thing where even if I'm watching the right stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's grounded sort of in real world, it's the same thing. I'm like, God damn the balls on those astronauts. Yeah. It's like, that's the unknown and they are heroically going forth. Love that shit. I think one of the reasons too, that meanwhile, I'm a coward, a complete and total (laughs) coward. (laughs) <laughs> one of the reasons that that rod taylor's performance really resonates with me especially those early scenes where he, any any scene where he's just ama- just expressing wonder at what he's created and what he's witnessing reminds me so much of my own father who was a scientist mm. and the way he was almost equally as passionate about what he did and the way when he would describe his science to you and he was so good at bringing it down to a a language level that everybody could understand. He was very good at explaining really complex concepts in a simple way. Did you way. ever witness him literally have a eureka moment? Of, I'm just curious. Like Not where, the moment like, itself, but he did when he when he had the discovery that led to the Nobel for just FYI. This may be the news to a lot of people watching. Eh? No, if you guys didn't know, Chad's father, the real deal, Nobel um, uh, Prize winning chemist. The, the closest I, I got to him actually experiencing a eureka moment with him was when he we went to dinner. It was a day or two after I think he had figured out the structure of Buckminster Fullerene, which is what later won him the Nobel. And it was that eureka moment where he figured out what the structure of this this molecule, this previously completely unknown form of carbon that, that he and his team had discovered. He was the one who figured out what the actual structure. They knew it had 60 carbon atoms. They didn't know what the structure was. He was the one who figured out it was a perfect sphere. And he was just... Just like Rod Taylor experience. in the movie, he was just like, yeah. yeah, this is it. This is the moment that all of us get into oh, science. Dude, for. You know, and he dude. was like a little, he was like a teenager, just just babbling with excitement. And and I was totally with him there, there with him. So when I see movies like this where the actors and the directors and the writers know enough to that science is important and wonderful and amazing, and it doesn't have to be a time machine, but in the course it helps when it right. is a movie right. like this, you've got to convey that that sense of wonder. And just sheer elation at the it's the same thing with the very concept of it. Yeah. And they spend the whole half of the first half of the movie talking about the maybe the first half. Not the first half, because it does move really well. Yeah, they don't waste much time, but they they do give it that time, like, hey, let's sit and talk about this for a while and just get get, percolate on the Movies that feature inspiration and just like real life uh when you're reading biographies of it when you see movies about artists it's the same thing artists writers whatever and yes it's also cliche to the point where did you ever see walk hard yes which is hilarious but but these like people would say you you you've just been walking so hard he's like walk hard (laughs) where inspiration hits and yeah you can you can do it that cliche and and funny but it is Great. And I have seen it a few times in my life with creative people, with their performers, artists, writers. Um, and I obviously can't witness it for myself. But the the thing where it's like, oh, shit, everything just clicked. The wonder of imagination and creativity and that extends to the sciences. I myself don't have a feel for math, chemistry, physics, whatever. I just appreciate it because I know it's the same. I know mm-hmm. those the neurons that yeah. are firing, the synapses, yeah. they're exactly the same. It's hitting yes. you in a pleasure center. And it's like your your mind literally opened to the heavens. And it's mm-hmm. just like, oh my God. And well, my, my and, father movies, and I had many conversations about that very subject. About yeah, you're because just, you're you just being saying, yeah. a musician as well as a scientific minded person and him being pure science, but you could meet there because it mm-hmm. is about that um that that kind of pure moment. And I, I, uh, I love that. I love that shit and movies that, and television shows or whatever that do a story about someone who is brilliant. They're missing out if they, I mean, it's important also to show there's a lot of work and failure, but if you miss out on a moment of inspiration where it's just like, yeah, then I came up with a thing I called a, a, a personal computer. 
<laughs> if that's how it gets delivered, then you've missed out because you, that exactly. is inspiring to everybody. Yeah. To the people that I have no interest in. I've even watched sports movies like Moneyball or something. And I'm sitting there going like, way to go, Jonah Hill. <laughs> way to yeah. figure out an algorithm that somehow tells you what, I mean, stuff like that. I, I love well, I, and, and sp- to, to that point, you're talking about personal computers. The reason why, one of the major reasons why Steve Jobs is such a such a uh, iconic figure for us and will always be, it was because, yeah, despite the fact he was a notorious asshole <laughs> in yeah. all manners and walk all manners uh, in all different departments of his life, yeah. family and business and friendship, he's a dick. But he was also incredibly f- passionate and very articulate about what he loved. And he, mm-hmm. that was not an act. He was being completely genuine about that. And that's why people love him. Yeah. So No, yeah. I mean, it is, th- we look for geniuses in every aspect of life. Sometimes there's a lot of con artistry involved in it, but, but you can usually tell when someone's genuinely engaged and genuinely tapped in. Mm-hmm. And does that forgive people for being bad humans? No. But at the same time, all day long, will I take my own personal inspiration from watching people just go, and then it occurred to me. And then it yeah. occurred to me is like, those are words like, yeah, tell me what occurred to you. And yeah. that's what led to the creation of this. Um, and I love music documentaries, even about musicians. I'm, you know, like Don't really care about music it. itself. I'm not a huge fan of. I've watched, right. you know, many a documentary about bands. I don't even actively like. But still, you see them in there jamming, and they're like going, fuck me, that's it. Do that again. Do that yeah. again. Yeah. And then I come in on this. And you're like, "Yeah, it's it. just magic, Chad. It's yeah. magic. You and me, creators, we're magicians, okay? That's right. Ooh. Don't let nobody ever tell you different. Yeah, and as soon as I get my cloak of levitation and the eye of Agamotto, I will be the sorcerer supreme. <laughs> okay. Still. So postscript conversation, and this, okay. this is this is where our, our our nerdy hearts will be ignited once again. On this, oh, thank on this God topic. you said ignited. I thought you were about to say explode, uh, <laughs> give up on us. That's where but, I was going with it. But uh, th- this because there's actually some really sort of heartwarming connections between time after time and Back to the Future. Uh, <laughs> some of which are kind of coincidental, but I think some of them are intentional. There's an interesting. Uh, and I'm getting into some other stuff here, but uh, Mary, Mary Steenburgen, her, her, her time for time was her second uh, motion picture. Was that after was Melvin in. and Howard? I can't remember. What it, I, I think it was right after Going South, which was her first one. Going oh. South, which was a Western with oh, Jack I Nicholson. Going South. I thought Melvin and Howard was her first. Well, whatever. But right, right before that's not important. Right before, <laughs> right before time after time, it was Going South with Jack Nicholson and Christopher Lloyd. A Western, right? You fast forward mm-hmm. about 10 years, Mary <laughs> Steen Virgin, Christopher Lloyd. That's in right. Back to, Back to the Future 3, oh, a that's Western. Great. Also, I the never date, made that connection. You're absolutely right. The date in the future that um, Malcolm McDonald's HG Wells travels to is November 5th, I believe, 1979. November 5th is also the date that's used in Back to the Future. November 5th, 1950. Right? Oh, you're blowing my mind. Yeah. So that was that do you was think, a very Do you think Zemeckis and Gale were at all aware of that, or is that just coincidence? Oh, yeah, they had to be. Yeah, yeah. I think I think so. That I think that movie the Bob's. is it's it's a cult classic, not just with fans, but with filmmakers in general. Just yeah, because it was and so I would ballsy. imagine they probably absorbed a lot of uh, time travel. They probably were like, let's watch all the time travel movies because they worked on those scripts. The first yeah. one, they worked on it for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and it kept changing and changing and changing. So mm-hmm. I'm sure they're like going, oh, you know, it'd be cool as if we put this in there. So I, th- I think that because it kind of breaks my heart that we never really got a sequel to George Powell. They did do a little sort of vignette with Rod Taylor and uh, which is named the guy who played uh, Philby. I forget his name, the actor's name mm. and, and Whit Bissell. They all came back to reprise their roles from the original film in one little scene where Rod Taylor's oh. character comes back to the present. I gave you up for dead long ago. And you're almost right a hundred times over, David, but I'm not dead. But uh, they never dead. really did a sequel. And it's, it's one of those movies I was like, I just want more of that, that character. <laughs> I just love 
his character well, so much. Well, you know that that was that was a time before. I mean, sequels before were sequels were a thing. Yeah, and it could have gone south. But I had this idea, Brandon. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, and this this kind of spun off of the the stuff that you hit me to the um, uh, this type of stuff where it's yeah. just completely fan- what if kind of thing. Like what if yeah. they had done better movies with this actor and that actor and you know, David <laughs> yes. Bowie is as a uh, brainiac. Frank God Grant. damn. What if, what if in the eighties or like early eighties, they'd done a sequel to George Powell's film with Rod Taylor and a young Robin Williams playing his son. Holy shit. Cause it's, it's, we haven't talked about this, but Rod Taylor's or has to say Robin Williams is a dead ringer for, for Rod Taylor. They um, look a lot alike. Rod Taylor the is the um, is the and stuff too. is the pinup, the handsome model version, right? Of but they they both are very good at conveying what the way that Rod Taylor so brilliant. I already talked about how he's so brilliant in that movie about conveying the sense of wonder. Rob Williams is really good at that kind of stuff too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very a lot of performances where he does that kind of thing. So I was just wondering, what if you, you we go have a sequel where it's set in the you know twenty years in the future where he you know. Uh, George and um, Weena have had a son, so he's like he, there's this young Eloy kid who who has to, uh, for some reason, has to travel back into the past for some <laughs> reason with his father. Like maybe they're maybe it's against his father's will, or he has to go back in the past for some reason, maybe to save his dad or something like that. And his dad's like, no, don't do it; it's too dangerous or whatever. And so, but but they they'd be like be like a father son adventure between the two of them. Dude, you, we'll never see it, but you could do it if you did it like this. Well. <laughs> It's time for you to start looking into rights and then, uh, and then you can write it. Uh, good luck finding an artist. That's always the hard thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I would read the shit out of that. And I don't know what the story is, but I just love that idea so much in a very weird, but sort of connected way. It's like my, I mean, we all have fantasies of a movie we liked that we wished had had a sequel and then we write it in our heads. And one of the ones for me was last starfighter. I kept thinking like, dude, they should over the last 10 years, you know, as anniversaries were coming up because the stars are still alive or at least the main two, it should all be about the fucking kids. In other words, I kept thinking it should be the thing in reverse where the Alex, the guy and his girlfriend, they go to the planet where he's, you know, He's uh, hailed as a hero. He saved the whole galaxy. They stay there. They get married. They have kids, but the kids have never been to their parents' native planet of Earth, and they go. And then they are the fish out of water, even though they look totally like a human. Uh, And maybe uh, they have to fight off their own alien invasion there or some kind of shit. But I just love the idea of like, pick up that story. Don't let it just sit there. It's got a wide open thing you can do. I haven't seen that movie in so long. Like I was excited when Tron uh, 2.0 came out and I enjoyed it. It it, it wasn't necessarily exactly what I wanted, but I did like it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I like when they have done sequels years after the original where the actors are still alive, but it gets handed off to somebody like the Creed movies. I mean, they're yeah. great. Blade and it is. Like you, yeah, yeah. You, exactly. So it's like, I love that when they're like, you know what? Why not? People liked that original and we've got a good idea. I didn't see the latest Bill and Ted, uh, speaking of time travel, but I at least appreciated it was that good. decades later, they're mm. like, no, we're finally going to do it. Here's the mm-hmm. third movie. Yeah. I love it. Let's do that. Let's it was do professionally sequels. good. They, that came out during the pandemic. I remember it was, it was yes. released to digital only because the theaters were all closed. It was actually pretty good. And I I'll actually went back to watch the first three. Is there three of them? No, no, then? two. It was, it was only two. two. Okay. Yeah. Excellent adventure. And, uh, um, uh, what was it? Bill and Ted bogus journey, bogus journey. Yeah. Um, then this is the other thought I had, which has already kind of been done because there was a cartoon series. Mm. Um, there was the, the back to the future oh, the cartoon series, the original no. ghostbusters. <laughs> no, no, they no. did have a cartoon series. I know. Yeah. They brought it which back. Was a after sequel. Ex- yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, no, no. as we fans of that movie would remember at the end of back to the future three, uh, you know, the, the DeLorean gets destroyed by a train. Right. And then right after that, uh, 
Christopher Lloyd's or Doc Brown and and uh, Mary Steenburgen's character show up in their flying the time future. train in a yeah this steampunk uh, time traveling uh, train Which with is their pretty sons damn cool. mm-hmm. with their sons Jules and Vern. Uh huh. Which they brought those characters were carried over into this really goofy, you know, Saturday morning cartoon series after that, which I never watched. But how cool would it be? Because they keep they keep saying like, oh, because Back to the Future is always coming back in the news and stuff because it's so beloved and and the, the yeah, it's one of those things. That one of those properties where the people who made the film love it so much. You know, um, yes, Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd, Mary Steenburgen, just, they just all love talking about the movie. And people will debate the merits of the sequels, but they're still great. They are, yeah. So my thought was, why not do a sequel that you don't even have to call it Back to the Future? You, I guess maybe maybe for marketing purposes, you have to weave it in there somehow. But just call it Jules oh, and Vern. Sure. Just call it Jules uh, and Vern. And it's a story about these two steampunk time travelers who, you know, Christopher Lloyd and Mary Steenburgen are going to have maybe small parts in it. But I, I would want to just see the brothers on some kind of adventure together and the story could be completely wild off the wall they can go in any direction in time you just need a story I, i'm this is just the setting i have no idea what the story would be it's something it's an idea that could very easily go wrong <laughs> because you'd you need know, very good writers point, to keep it of, grounded because of what's popular it would be multiversal it would be something about you know oh all the travels that our our uh dad did fucked up multiple timelines and we have to go back and then they end up meeting alternate versions of doc brown and themselves evil jewels evil Vern, that kind of thing uh or another tannin like the the tannins are now yeah, like some it. sort of intergalactic bounty hunters or some kind of shit i i i'm down for it they just need what? to call again they, they need what? let the bobs know that they just need to call us yes and we'll <laughs> we'll take it from there but uh, I, I just would love to see that. And by the way, yeah, me we were, too. when we were talking about Hello Tomorrow a few weeks ago, yes. I, I likened it to cyberpunk. What I meant to say was steampunk. I just didn't catch I that. That's I, was what editing it. I was like, wait a minute. That's not what I meant to say. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you finally came clean because the amount of emails we've been getting is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But so. uh, I've been keeping up with it, though. I am two episodes behind still, but um, it's just so good. Everyone in it is great. so good. Yeah, it is really saved by the fact that every character in it is completely unique. Like I would follow storylines with any of their characters. Mm-hmm. Um, the main story is great, but I'm sort of like going, geez, I just, I'd watch an episode that was just Cheryl. I'd watch an episode that was just, you know, um, the guy with the, the cleft palate, who's the insurance yes. guy. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. Loving that stuff. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm and I'm I'm enjoying Cap, uh sorry to Captain Picard. I'm enjoying uh, Picard season three. I was I figured you would. This thing is I was, and that last I was episode, withholding judgment at first because I was like just, just you waiting were for very like I'm still because I was all in immediately and you're like mm. we'll see. <laughs> so far no, I'm it, enjoying it. It's very good. Um yeah. it that last episode just killed me, man. Mm-hmm. It killed me. It was so good. Mm-hmm. Um we will how about next week we'll we need to chat mandalorian and we'll have new episodes to talk about and picard yep. we need to catch up on that shit okay um and i guess there's also been a few dc rumors and some uh, shazam fallout oh, all kinds of things to talk about a certain guy named uh james has confirmed jimmy! he's going to be directing the superman movie that he's been writing hey jimmy, hey, jimmy. Yeah. he's gonna be directing did, it did you see the the thing he posted about what his brother said no oh wait what did he well, say? I, I well, see he it. was he was hang, no, he was hanging with his brother, and and he just happened to mention when uh, Superman Legacy is due to drop, and his brother got teary, and he goes, "What? What's the deal?" He goes, "Don't you even know that's our dad's birthday?" That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, I, I know that's just, but yeah, that goes straight to it. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm I'm directing it." And everything he's actually said, and it's exactly what we thought. He's he's mentioned vaguely. He goes, it is just about him dealing with the legacy idea. It is early Superman, but it's him trying to balance what he learned from his father, Jonathan Kent, as well as the legacy of him being 
the son of Jor-El and it's it's that thing and that's why i kept saying like that's what the legacy thing is because it's not going to be about him with his kid they are literally starting over with a young superman i can't get enough of that i mean i'm Mm -hmm. just hoping they find the right actor but i'm trusting i'm very trusting we'll talk about it next week let's wrap up because i'm starving i'm about to (laughs) eat my own hand all right (laughs) so (laughs) 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 the charles nel